Um, <laughs> let me introduce our speaker, Nina, uh, Professor Nina Amenta uh, grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, moved to California after college to work in the medical imaging industry. After a few years of that, she went to graduate school at Berkeley and then worked at the University of Minnesota, Xerox Park, and the University of Texas before coming back to UC Davis, where she is a professor in the computer science department. Yep. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Amenta. So, in addition to being a professor of computer science, I have recently become the director of something called the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, or CITRUS, um, at UC Davis. It's a collaboration across a bunch of uh, the UC campuses. And the idea of this thing is to get um, computer scientists, electrical engineers, mathematicians, statisticians, people who work with data, to do things that are actually useful for society. Um, so uh, this, is the, this is something I'm actually very interested in doing. So um, I'm going to talk today, oh thank you, okay, about something that um, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, sort of an area that I'm trying to uh, uh, move into now. So this is sort of a new interest of mine um, that I'm sharing with you guys. Okay, so um, and it involves LIDAR, it involves cap and trade, and it involves uh, a little bit of probability. So, let me begin by explaining what LIDAR is. So LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It's sort of a play on uh, radar, um, and, the idea is, and it's supposed to be like radar, except that it's using light. It's using uh, laser light, so there's an instrument um, usually carried on an airplane, and uh, the instrument em emits little blips of laser light, um, and then objects on the ground uh, reflect that light. Um, and then the time it takes the reflection to get back to the instrument on the airplane where it's detected tells you the depth of the object that got hit, right? Okay, um, so you get a, a, a distance from the instrument, right? And then uh, one thing we should notice um, while, we're, while we're here talking about the pulses, is that um, one pulse of laser light, um, it's a laser, it's very narrow, right? But it's coming from way up high, so it spreads out somewhat. So one pulse um, uh, might hit several objects, and you, you might see several reflections from one pulse of light. Um, so like in this case, uh, the, it's hitting one branch of the tree, another branch of the tree, a third branch of the tree, and then finally the ground. And so. The, the machine up there would detect sort of four pulses in response. Um, okay, so each of those pulses becomes, uh, uh, a, you know, represents a point on the object. Okay, and uh, even in a, if you're flying over a very dense forest, we might find that there's going to be uh, many points that appear uh, on the ground. Okay, that's not all going to be the tops of the trees. All right, and so as the airplane is flying along, it's a, uh, scanning this instrument from side to side, back and forth. So they're sort of a, laying down a zigzag pattern of these uh, laser pulses on the ground. Um, and what that does is it covers a, it covers a, a you know, a good sized area. Um, and then um, the position of the plane is tracked amazingly accurately um, using a combination of GPS and something they call the IMU, the Inertial Measurement Unit that measures how fast the plane is flying and how uh, uh, turning and uh, pitching and rolling and whatever. Um, and uh, so we get the position of the, of the instrument amazingly accurately, which means that if we have all these distances, which are also amazingly accurate, um, we can take, uh, we end up with um, a cloud of points, okay, that represent uh, the stuff that you see on the ground, okay? So um, whatever is down there, the earth, uh, vegetation, buildings, um, and so this is becoming uh, more and more, you know, as the instruments get better and better and it gets, uh, uh, you know, more and more reasonably priced to do this, um, this is becoming more and more of a tool in um, uh, earth sciences and environmental mod uh, monitoring of various sorts. So people use it in geology a lot. Um, so this particular picture actually is a, a, a very big cloud of points. 
that was taken along the uh, fault line in uh, Haiti, uh, right after the Haiti earthquake, um, by the uh, US uh, Geological Services, and the visualization was done by uh, one of our labs here at UC Davis. Um, so other people that I know in Citrus are using um, uh, using uh, LIDAR for monitoring the snowpack in the Sierras. So um, they see what the ground level is in the, in the summer, and then they fly over it again in the winter, and they see what the, what, the, what the level of the snow is over the ground. And this gives them you know, a very accurate map of how deep the snow is in various places. It's used in urban planning. You can get like, you know, not just a map, but an entire three-dimensional model of your city. Um, and the thing that I'm particularly interested in is uh, using it for um, monitoring forests, okay? You wanna see uh, how well a forest is doing, um, how, how big the trees are, and how healthy the forest is. All right, and so here's a, a specific problem in using LIDAR for forest monitoring. So if you fly over a forest instead of over, you know, a pretty uh, empty patch of ground, um, what you're going to see is just a bunch of floods, right? Which is the, the trees of the forest. Um, and you'll have, you know, sort of probably, typically many points per, per uh, laser pulse. Um, and what we want to do is we want to take this, uh, this scan of, uh, fuzz, this fuzzy looking scan, and we want to um, identify the individual trees in the, in the forest. Okay. Uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, I think this is not going to work because we had to transfer the movie. Okay, so I had a little movie of uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, LIDAR forest in the Sierras. But let me get to the question of um, why am I interested in doing this? So one reason is that um, for, I don't know, probably the last decade of my career, I've done um, a lot of work involving um, handling clouds of three-dimensional points, mostly in the, um, uh, for problems related to computer graphics, where you have a model of some, uh, uh, you know, character or something like that, and you want to get it into the computer so you can fool around with it, or for um, uh, uh, people in biology and in natural history where they, uh, they want to get, you know, three-dimensional objects of things like um, uh, fossils and stuff like that, and they want to, you know, um, be able to do analysis on them and morph them and things like that, you know, like, like, uh, yeah, okay, so anyway, so I've done a lot of stuff with fossils. It's been really fun. However, okay, um, I'm actually interested in doing things that are, you know, ee, a little more useful to society at this point, okay, and LIDAR is one of those things that, uh, uh, where you have collections of 3D points, which is what I understand, um, and it's actually a really important problem. Okay, so why is it an important problem? It's an important problem because of global warming, okay? Global warming is one of those things that um, uh, I am really uh, uh, concerned about and I, I think a lot of other people are really concerned about. Um, so this is, a, this is a visualization that uh, NASA does uh, periodically of uh, the Arctic ice cap. Um, so the top picture is uh, 1979 and that's sort of typical for, you know, around that time. Um, 2007 was the smallest Arctic ice cap, uh, the summer extent of the Arctic ice cap that they ever measured. And you can see that it's dramatically smaller. When I first saw these pictures, they absolutely knocked my socks off, you know? I mean, I was like, it's, it's really, a, it gives you this real visceral sense of uh, how the planet is changing and, and uh, uh, what a dramatic effect it's having. Um, so, uh, so 2007 was actually the worst year ever, but this year, 2012, um, it, it looks like we're well on track to beating 2007. So, um, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of obvious visual differences in how the planet is, uh, is changing, and the people who are modeling climate change predict that we're gonna see increasing drought, we're gonna see increasing floods, we're gonna see more and larger storms, we're gonna see sea level rise from somewhere between one meter to five meters between now and uh, uh, 2100, 2100. 2100, they're predicting at least by then that that polar ice cap is gonna be completely gone in the summer. I mean, the planet is changing in dramatic ways and it has gotta be, uh, uh, you know, it's gonna cause all kinds of trouble. And I don't understand why more people aren't 
really concerned about this, or they don't seem to be really concerned about this, um, but I certainly am. Okay, so what can I do about it? I'm somebody who knows how to deal with clouds of points in three-dimensional space. Okay, so, oh, oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to say about that, which is that since I've become obsessed with climate change, one of the things that uh, I was amazed to learn was that this, uh, the, the, the model that if you increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, that uh, the planet is gonna get hotter. Um, you know, people portray this as this incredibly complicated and, you know, difficult thing and how could anybody possibly know this? But in fact, the, this, this theory and this observation goes back to this guy, John Tyndale, in the 1860s, you know? So like while we were enjoying the Civil War, he was, um, he was discovering uh, the, you know, the mechanism of greenhouse gases. Okay, so it's not, it, it's not really, uh, uh, you know, like the basic idea that you're putting all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and that the planet is gonna get hotter um, and that, that that's gonna affect sea level and that's gonna affect weather. That's not really rocket science. Okay, anyway. So where, where are these greenhouse gases coming from? So we hear a lot about uh, the greenhouse gases that are coming from energy supply and transportation, okay? And those are, in fact, a big chunk. Um, but, uh, and, you know, and, and, and we try and do something about the stuff that, kind of, that has to do with residential and commercial buildings, you know, we try and turn off the lights and stuff like that. Um, but actually, a big chunk of it um, comes from forestry. And what they mean by forestry here is um, deforestation and degradation of forests. Okay, so forests store a lot of carbon, um, and if you're cutting down the trees, uh, and especially if you're cutting down and burning the trees, um, then they're not storing a lot of carbon anymore. Okay, that carbon is going into the atmosphere. And we need to attack every slice of this problem. Okay, so one way of attacking it. This is, this is a, a plan that uh, uh, a lot of people are working on. Um, we're going to uh, set up this system of carbon for forest carbon offsets. So the idea here is you have somebody, um, a landowner uh, who, uh, or possibly a, a government that manages um, some uh, uh, patch of forest, um, and uh, they make an agreement with someone who is a carbon emitter, uh, so a power plant, for example. The power plant um, you know, should have levels of carbon. It's trying to reduce the amount of carbon that it's emitting, but it can't succeed in doing that. So it makes a deal with the, uh, with the, the person with the forest, and the person with the forest says, okay, I am gonna um, stop cutting down trees in my forest. I'm gonna allow the trees to grow. Those trees are gonna absorb a bunch of carbon, and that's gonna offset the excess carbon that you, you know, the power plant are emitting. Um, and, uh, and, the, and for this to work, okay, you have to be very sure that that person who is uh, managing the forest is actually gonna be storing this carbon in the forest, okay? And so in order for this to work, you've gotta be able to um, observe and measure and verify the amount of carbon that's stored in a chunk of forest. So there's two uh, sort of, uh, main tracks that I'm interested in, in as far as, uh, you know, the, the, the protocols, these protocols is sort of like the way you make these agreements. So there's sort of two tracks in the protocols that I'm interested in. One is uh, uh, the RED system, which is organized by the United Nations, and it's uh, um, mostly involving tropical forests in third world countries, um, and they sell the offsets globally. Um, and so far it's mostly a voluntary market, but it is actually an active market and these offsets are being uh, bought and sold. Um, and then the second part, this is like a really interesting opportunity that we have now in California. So California, you may know, um, we have this uh, sort of landmark climate change law, uh, AB 32. We're gonna try and limit greenhouse gases. Um, and part of that system is a cap and trade system that's gonna involve forest offsets. Um, so emitters in California can purchase up to 8% of uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of carbon they're allowed to emit as offsets, and 75% of that must be from California. So we're interested in monitoring both tropical forests um, and California forests. California forests mostly interesting because we want to, you know, see that this cap and trade regimen actually works. And the tropical forests are interesting because most of that deforestation that's actually, con that's actually con uh, contributing to climate change 
That's happening in the tropical forests. Okay, so how is verification done nowadays? Um, uh, mostly, uh, what happens is you send people out into the forest with a tape measure, and they measure the trees. Okay, and this is, this is uh, you know, sort of written into the protocols. Um, so you can't get to very many of the trees. Uh, this way you have to do little samples. Um, so it's not incredibly accurate. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, it's expensive. It's hard to do. You have to get people, you know, way out into the woods and they have to be, you know, sort of trained and trusted people. And uh, it's also not um, the most, um, uh, you know, it's easy to cheat, basically. Um, okay, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to take this LIDAR technology and develop it to the point where um, it's, it's usable, it's accurate, it's cheaper than sending people out to the forests, and it's um, uh, more accurate than sending people out into the forests. Um, and, uh, and then have that be incorporated into these protocols. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So part of, the, part of the problem, not the whole problem, but part of the problem in, in uh, associating um, uh, a LIDAR scan with a, uh, a, an amount of carbon, right, is um, uh, finding individual trees. Because the trunks of the individual trees, that's where most of the carbon is. Okay, you have these big, thick, you know, tubes, basically, of carbon. Okay, so this problem of finding the individual trees is important. Okay, so how do, how do people do it now? So, so this is, let me, let me go over sort of what the, the, sort of the standard approach to this. So um, first of all, uh, like I said, even in fairly dense forests, you're gonna find a lot of ground points. So what we do is we take all of the points um, and we impose a grid, uh, like, a, like a XY grid, on the, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, parallel to the ground, okay? Um, and uh, we put each, all of the points into, uh, into individual grid cells. Then in each grid cell, we take the bottom one and we assume that's ground. It's gonna be a little noisy, maybe we'll have to throw some out. Um, but basically from those ground points, we make um, a, a, a model, a grid-based model of the ground. Okay, so that's what this uh, gray part down here is supposed to be. Okay, and then we take the trees, okay, we take all the rest of the points, and from all those other points, we subtract the ground level, okay? So this makes it, even though the ground itself is lumpy, right, this sub subtracts out the lumpy ground, and so what we get is trees on a flat surface. Okay. Um, all right, so then we look at the highest point in each grid cell, and then we, we assume that that is uh, a point in the top of the canopy of the forest, okay? The canopy is what they call the part with the, you know, all the leaves up at the top, okay? So uh, we take those highest points and we form a canopy surface. And the canopy surface, at least in a, you know, like a California or an Oregon pine surface, is gonna be kind of like this. It's gonna be surprisingly pointy, okay? And so looking at this, you have, mm, you know, some sense that, that we're, we wanna take each one of those points and call that point a tree. Um, so how do you define exactly what's a point and exactly how much of the um, bulge goes into uh, this thing that you're defining as a tree? So what we do is we take the canopy and we think of turning it upside down, okay, so that it's like a cup now. Um, and then we imagine flooding that thing from the bottom, okay, so water is, is, is gradually rising up through this, uh, uh, through this lumpy surface. Um, and we're going to use the way the water rises and the way these, uh, uh, you know, so, so when it starts, right, it's going to be like all separate basins. And as it comes up, the basins grow together. And we're going to use that process to define uh, specific chunks, each of which we're going to call a tree. Okay, so here's a, here's a, a visualization of that watershed algorithm. Say we have um, uh, very low areas here, the, the very low is black. And then that flat gray is sort of medium, and these, uh, these hilly parts are supposed to represent dikes in between them. Okay, and as the water rises up, it covers the really deep parts, 
It's rising higher, higher. And as it gets to places where it's uh, joining together two basins, we think of building like a little dam. Okay? And those little dams are going to be the boundaries between the basins. And those, those boundaries are going to define the chunks that we call uh, one tree or another. Okay, so um, uh, usually this is implemented using uh, uh, just uh, the grid that I was talking about before. So you have like an X, Y grid of little cells. So it's sort of like you're playing the game of life or something like that. At every step, you uh, add some extra cells because the water is getting higher and each basin gets bigger. And where two basins grow together, we build this little dam. All right, so this is sort of the, the you know, standard approach to dividing this into trees. Um, and it's got a, a, a number of drawbacks, which you could probably uh, think of more yourself, okay? But here's a few. So one is that it ignores all the points except the highest and the lowest. In a forest, typically, you might get three or four, okay? And we're ignoring all that intermediate stuff. Um, we're taking this data, which is points, okay, floating in three-dimensional space, and we're putting them onto a grid, right? And every time we do that, we're losing, uh, you know, we're, it's like you're taking a, a, a decimal number and you're rounding it, right? You're losing information there. You're losing all the decimal places. Um, and another thing is that it doesn't take the shape of the trees into account, right? It, it's perfectly happy to, to you know, uh, come up with a tree that looks like, you know, a little Scotty dog or something like that, when you, you know that the shape of a tree should be more or less round. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, it doesn't you know, work all that great. I mean, it, it is a, a harder problem than it looks. This I, this I think is certainly true. But um, typically, you get uh, error rates of between 50% you know, and 75% when you try and take the tree segmentations that you do with this watershed algorithm and try and line them up with uh, um, trees that you have in, uh, uh, you know, that you've actually found by going out and measuring the trees in the forest with a tape measure. OK, so um, let me describe some, uh, uh, like, another line of attack that uh, uh, some of us here at uh, UC Davis have been uh, working on, okay? And, and the idea here, and you know, we are certainly not the only people uh, who are doing this, but the idea here is that we're sh we should take some uh, ideas from uh, pattern recognition, okay, which is sort of the field of looking for specific patterns in clouds of data. We should take some ideas from pattern recognition and see if we can craft a pattern recognition algorithm that will find trees. Okay, in 3D clouds of points. Okay, so this is sort of the classic thing that pattern recognition was designed to do. Um, but for the purposes of explaining how this is going to uh, work, instead of talking about finding trees in uh, a three-dimensional point cloud, what I'm going to do is talk about finding uh, circles in a, um, a, a collection of, uh, uh, like a scatter of points in the plane. Okay, so here, you know, you might see you, you could see where you might pick out circles that, uh, that a lot of points uh, uh, are, supposed to, are supposed to lie on. Um, so for example, uh, these might be good circles um, because they have lots of points near the boundaries of the circles. Okay? And so we, we, the idea is we're going to take the scatter of points, we're going to look for circles like this, and uh, uh, we want to take, take a similar idea with trees, where we're going to take the 3D points, and we want to find a lot of points that lie on something that is roughly tree-shaped. Okay, but let's just talk about circles for, for the time being. Okay, so how are we going uh, to do this? So here's one idea. So this is an algorithm that uh, has a name also. It's um, RANSAC for Random Sample and Consensus. Um, and the idea is that we're going to make random choices, and then uh, we're going to check each random choice and see if it's a good circle or not. I mean, it's, it's really deep as a puddle, but uh, here we go. So we've got, uh, so, so picking, so say we want to define a circle, okay? We have a little cloud of points. We want to define a circle. It takes three points to define a circle. If you take three points in the plane, there's a unique circle that goes through those three points. And in general, if you take four, there's not going to be a circle that goes through them. Okay, unless they're four points that you know, were chosen so that they, they all lie on a circle. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick triples of points. We're gonna take the circle that's defined by those triples of points and then we're gonna check and see if that's a good circle or not. Okay, 
Um, so we, we, we look at the nearby points, and uh, we see if um, uh, a bunch of them lie near the boundary of the circle. So in this case, the blue ones do, the pink ones don't. And we call the blue ones the uh, inliers, um, and the pink ones the outliers. So um, if we have enough inliers, then we say, okay, this looks like it's going to be a good circle. All right. And then we do a little adjustment. We say, okay, let's try and fit those inliers as well as we possibly can, see if we pick up any other inliers. Um, and we'll score this uh, circle based on how well the inliers actually fit the circle. Um, okay, and then, uh, all right, we've found a circle um, and we've given it a score. And then what we're going to do is we're going to repeat. And um, the result of the algorithm is the highest scoring circle that we, that we find for the, for the point set. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so for, to do this for finding trees in a three-dimensional point cloud, what we do is we look at uh, um, little areas. So we pick a random, uh, a random point on one of those trees, a, a random point out of the cloud. Um, and then we pick some other, um, consider a little area around that random point. And then within that little area, uh, uh, we, we find, um, uh, well, we want to fit a, uh, 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 an upside down um, uh, paraboloid in this case. Okay, that's sort of our model of what a tree is shaped like. It's shaped like an upside down paraboloid. So um, that's going to take us four points in 3D to fit this upside down paraboloid. Um, so we find four points in the nearby area, we fit our paraboloid, and we go through this whole process again. Okay. Um, good. So this is a randomized algorithm, meaning that each attempt starts with a random choice. Okay. So it's certainly possible, because we're doing things at random, that uh, you know, we could keep repeating this forever and we would never find a good tree or we would never find a good circle. Okay. Um, but it's very unlikely that that would happen. Um, and th the probability that that's going to happen depends on how many points are inliers and how many points are outliers, right? If almost everything is outliers and you're looking for a needle in a haystack, well, yeah, digging around randomly is not really going to help all that much, right? But if, um, uh, you know, it's half inliers and half outliers, after a while, you expect to be able to actually find, uh, uh, you know, you expect to actually be able to zero in on one of these trees. Okay. So one of the things we do with, uh, with this ransack algorithm, one of the, the arguments we make that this is a decent algorithm, um, is that uh, we consider, uh, you know, how many repetitions are we going to have to do? Um, and uh, the core of that argument is, is actually really simple. So let's say an attempt fails if it doesn't pick all inliers as its random choice, okay? And the, the uh, uh, and, let, and say F is the probability of failure, okay? So F, you know, you can estimate or you can guesstimate what F is, um, and it's gonna depend on how many points you need to pick to fit the shape, you know, so three for circles, four for, for paraboloids, you know, something more complicated will take more points. Okay, so it depends on how many points you have to pick, and it depends on the ratio of outliers to inliers. Okay. Um, but let's say you can, uh, you can uh, come up with some probability f of failure. All right, then the probability that um, if you run the algorithm m times, um, okay, where, where we're trying to figure out how many times do I need to run this. So say we run it m times, the probability of m failures is going to be f raised to the nth power. Okay, because it means you have to fail and fail again and fail again and fail again. So you multiply together the probabilities. All right. Um, so, okay, so say we want um, uh, the, the probability of failure to be less than one half. Okay, um, that, that seems reasonable. Then uh, we have a little equation in M, and uh, we can solve it in M. And what we find is that M should be greater than one over the log base two of F. Okay, negative one over log base two of f. Okay, so notice that uh, f is a probability, so it's a fraction. So log base two of f is going to be a negative number. So this is going to be some positive number here. Okay. Um, 
negative one over log base two of f is going to be a positive number. Um, and the bigger f gets, okay, the more your probability of failure, the bigger that number is going to get because f is in the um, denominator, right? Okay, so you, you, so yeah, you have to make more trials if your probability of failure is bigger. But as your probability of failure increases, okay, m is only going to increase as the log of the probability of failure. Okay, and that's pretty good, okay, because the log is going to grow. You know, as your probability of failure increases, okay, it gets really bad, m is going to be growing more slowly. So this is our argument that this is not such a bad, uh, such bad algorithm. Okay, um, okay. So doing this in forests, well, okay. How does this work in practice? Um, so what the what what what, what uh, our team did was they took uh, field measurements on uh, 20 little plots. Okay, they went out and actually measured the trees, um, and they compared our measure the measurements of trees from the lidar to the measurements in real life. Um, and on 11 of the 20 plots, it was great, okay? It did just fine. Um, uh, but on about uh, eight of the plots, um, it still missed a significant portion of the trees that were there, okay? And part of the problem here is that uh, um, it's not very good, the way they implemented it, it's not very good at capturing like little trees that might be hidden underneath big trees. And finding those little trees is hard for just about any algorithm, okay? so. It's not, you know, off 75% of the time, you know, like the, 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 the watershed algorithm was, but it's still far from perfect, okay? Um, and so one of the things we want to do is, uh, you know, try and do something a little more sophisticated than this um, and uh, uh, see what we can do about this, this issue of finding uh, uh, trees in LiDAR data. So there's a, there's a bunch of challenges here. I think actually that we're going to be able to make pretty good progress on um, the kinds of forests that we have, you know, here in California and in Oregon and in Canada and in uh, you know northern Europe, which are dominated by pine trees, um, because you know really pine trees, if you look at the lidar cl cloud, they're pretty easy to see. They're you know they're shaped like Christmas trees and they've got these pointy branches and you can see the pointy branches, which is something that nobody's using. Um, so I really think that that, that should be uh, uh, quite doable. Um, but the harder and probably more significant problem is doing this for tropical forests, okay? So you've heard that tropical forests have, you know, I don't know, 90% of the world's biodiversity or something like that. Well, the trees themselves also are incredibly diverse in tropical forests. So it's not like there's like sort of one shape that you're looking for. You need to have like sort of a whole arsenal of shapes that you're, that you're uh, that you're able to find. Um, so this is a harder problem, but on the other hand, it's where the, the, the action really is in terms of deforestation. So this is where you know, we're really contributing greenhouse gases to the climate. So, um, uh, so, it's, so it's important to be able to attack this problem. Okay, so, um, so there's sort of two schools of thought in this whole um, uh, tree analysis thing. There's uh, uh, people like, you know, my colleagues here at Davis who believe that it's really important to find individual trees and that that's going to be the key to the whole thing. And then there's people who think that um, you should just take the LiDAR cloud and uh, come up with statistical, come up based on um, uh, uh, statistical analysis of, uh, you know, uh, plots measure, you know, plots that you could measure versus what the LIDAR for those plots look like. Do some kind of statistical analysis and come uh, and directly go for the number, how much carbon is stored in this piece of forest without trying to analyze the cloud and seeing, uh, you know, what, what's actually in it. Um, so they just try and take a function that'll go straight from LIDAR cloud to amount of carbon stored. Um, uh, this approach is probably also more difficult in tropical forests, again, because it's, it's more diverse and there, there's more stuff that you've got to learn. Okay, however, I think, you know, as usual, when you have like two schools of thought, usually synthesis is the answer, right? So, um, uh, so what I'm interested in doing is uh, a, a lot more pattern recognition, be able to find different kinds of uh, uh, shapes in this data, see if, we, see if we can actually rec recognize, you know, sort of the branchiness of pine trees, for example. Um, use the fact that trees are likely to be symmetric about the trunk. Use the fact that trees are very self-similar, OK? 
Okay, people have uh, written programs to generate trees back in computer graphics, my old world. You know, they, use, they, they write programs to generate trees using the fact that, you know, one branch looks pretty much like another branch and the little branchlets coming off a big branch look kind of like small versions of the big branch and so forth. Um, so they have this sort of fractal nature to them. Um, okay. Uh, and then uh, I think, you know, using the, the pattern recognition te techniques and the statistical techniques in conjunction, probably, uh, uh, you know, like the pattern recognition is sort of one of the inputs that you throw into the statistical techniques is probably the, uh, uh, you know, going to be like what the ultimate answer is going to be. I mean, it's probably going to be an incredibly complicated program once it's, uh, uh, you know, once sort of consensus is reached and we actually have a way of doing this. Okay, so that's about it. Thank you. Our what? Um, yeah, so um, there, there was for a while, NASA had a LIDAR satellite. And, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. There was for a while, NASA had uh, a LIDAR satellite for a while, and I'm not sure, I, I, think, I think they no longer do, but you know, there's sort of plans on the table for to have another one up. If you do it from as high up as a satellite, um, you don't, you get, you, your, your chances of, your, your points are scattered uh, much more widely. So you can't, you, you know, you really have no hope of seeing individual trees. Sort of the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, no, it's, it's, uh, uh, it does really well with clouds, and that's one of the one of the things that uh, I mean. That's one of the reasons, like the satellite people liked it a lot, you know, because uh, uh, they do all this visual imagery, and then uh, you know, half the time there's clouds and they can't see anything. But the lidar does go right through it, so that's good. Um, yeah, guy in the back. Um, you know, you send somebody up and they do it in a well. Okay, so. I, yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean by a good-sized forest. Yeah, <laughs> so like the, the you know, uh, so the, like the patches that we have were captured over um, uh, the course of a few days, and they're, mm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I can't really give a good answer, so we'll skip that, sorry. It's, uh, I, I mean, you... So people have done, let me just say in terms of like how much people have actually done, right? Um, so right now they've done um, mostly, you know, reasonably small areas, you know, something like, uh, you know, the size of a park or something like that. You know, they haven't done the entire state of Oregon or something like that. Um, although one of the states, I can't remember which one it is, but one of the states has plans to get LIDAR for the entire state. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of concerns about the safety, um, but I've yeah, but I've never <laughs> I've never heard of anybody trying to mount it on a on, on commercial jets. I guess the other thing is that you know commercial jets are flying. Yeah, I'm just you know riffing off this, but commercial jets are flying along specific routes, so you would get that route over and over again. You know, and uh, people are more interested in getting sort of a, you know, broad swaths of, uh, of territory. So maybe, maybe the reason people don't do it is that, you know, you would only get those areas. Um, let's get some people over here. Yeah. Um, when the laser point hits, let's say, a tree branch, mm -hmm. won't the tree radius that you are using the randomized uh, point to circle, won't that be false? Because you'll be hitting the branches but not the tree trunk. So. Yeah, so here's the thing. We don't see much of the tree trunk, okay, which is why we're modeling trees as an upside-down paraboloid. Uh, so we're, so that, that is sort of like uh, supposed to be, you know, like the outside surface of a pine tree, 
Um, and, and you can't, I, I mean, if you're very, very lucky, you hit the trunk. The problem is that the trunk is vertical, and also the laser beam is coming down vertical. So your chances of hitting the trunk are really slim. Um, so you don't get many, many trunk points. Some of the best methods for finding individual trees do, um, you know, sort of uh, classify everything, uh, uh, you know, as leaves and branches and stuff that they possibly can. And then they take sort of the leftover stuff that they have no idea what it is, and they look for trunks in there. Um, and they actually find some, which is great. So, uh, uh, so that's a good approach, yeah. Um, okay, how about you? How long have people been working on all this? LIDAR and the algorithms? Ah, um, before, radar. before radar? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure, that's a good question. So, yeah, the, the, so this, this, this problem of uh, uh, finding trees. So people have been doing the watershed algorithm where you take the surface and turn it upside down. Um, uh, that was something that, that uh, people did with uh, LIDAR scans of ground, you know, because they were actually interested. It's called the watershed algorithm because it, you, they were actually interested in finding watersheds and where water flows on the earth. Um, so it was sort of like those tools were there before people got interested in uh, trying to do this with forests. So people have been doing that for a long time, um, but uh, uh, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, sort of ferment and people coming out with different algorithms and different approaches for, uh, uh, for the tree problem, you know, to try and replace the watershed algorithm. That's still a, you know, ongoing and, uh, uh, you know, active research area. Okay, one more? Is there one more? Yeah? Okay. Mm -mm -mm, no, you can go and set up a, you can set up the instrument on the ground and, you know, sort of scan back and forth. And uh, people do that to make models of buildings often. Um, and you can get beautiful models of trees if you do that. But the problem is you're still sending somebody out into the forest. Yeah. So let's thank our